Ow! And 10 scrapped features. It turns out FNAF had a whole load of features planned that were never actually implemented fully or that were changed last minute. I talked about how Freddy was only meant to jump scare you after you lost power in another video, and I talked about a few others in different FNAF lists. If you guys want a whole list on scrapped FNAF features, let me know in the comments. Is it something that people would actually want because it's something that I want to do? Or is it more so something that I do just to talk about things and change things up? Because we're kind of running out of FNAF lists. If you have any ideas, let me know. When I look at these features that I want to keep hidden for the purposes of another list, if you want it at least, I can only imagine how different the game would be if they had added these things like alarms for every hour or animatronics coming down other hallways. It would have changed the game and potentially made it worse for wear. And I'm Freddy in the bathroom. Freddy is in an odd situation when you look at things from an outsider's perspective. Sure, we know he likes to hide from the camera, and technically these robots have no sense of biological sex, but like, come on, Freddy. You should know not to hide in the girls' bathroom no matter what, unless you want to get cancelled. However, that's not the scary part. Even though AI sentient enough to have that kind of crisis coming was pretty damn terrifying. The scary part is that what if we've been wrong this whole time? What if Chica isn't the only girl in the series? If Freddy is also a female, this could flip everything on its head. If we can't even understand who Freddy is meant to be, can we really trust anything we know about the series? We thought Scott threw a curveball when he added himself canonically into the games, but what would happen if Freddy was female? Oh boy, I'm having an existential crisis now. Number 8, Afton's Flesh. In Five Nights at Freddy's 3, we are introduced to the character known as Springtrap, the golden springlock bonnie suit with William Afton barely clinging to life inside. He has been poked and prodded more than people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. And while he is still alive, it appears as if he's just been rotting away or hell, even just gotten his skin torn off when the spring lock's activated, resulting in getting spiked in multiple places, but still somehow surviving. In some of the scenes slash menus we can get in Five Nights 3, we can actually see that this is the case. As we get a close look at Springtrap with his mouth open, revealing the hardly living body of William Afton inside. His skin has been peeled off from the looks of it, or it is at least extremely raw, but no mistake, that is old Willie Afton sitting in that suit. This can be seen regularly and there's no need to really do anything specific to see it, but it does require a keen eye and, I can tell you, I never noticed it. I can't even see the ketchup when it's right in front of me, let alone something hidden underneath a Golden Spring Bonnie suit. And it's 7, Golden Background. FNAF 3 introduced the mechanic of needing to make repairs. Maybe the ventilation got shut down or the audio was corrupted, or maybe the camera stopped working. And if any of this happens, the player needs to reboot that system. While you do this, the cameras you see are just static. However, sometimes the static can sometimes show the face of Golden Freddy. Like, dude, I know times are tough having to deal with like 15 missing children at this point, but there's no need to turn into a cam girl. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh crap. I'm not getting out of the semi. No matter what, it is indeed possible to see the face of Golden Freddy in the static. It's not clear, it does take some keen observation, but it's quite subtle. But once you see it, you will never be the same. Mostly because you'll have seen it, and that means that you will have changed, because before, you hadn't seen it. Logic. Unit 6, The Hidden Skull. Man, FNAF 3 has a lot going for it, doesn't it? The FNAF 3 minigames are honestly the main game of FNAF 3. You gotta play them to get the right combo of numbers to dial into a brick wall, then you gotta click the toy bonnie on your desk to get the glitch minigames, and then you need to put five kids to rest in order to get the good canon ending to the game. However, if you really pay attention during the free roam minigames, if you head to the supply closet, somewhere I don't believe that Shadow Freddy brings you, you can see the same supply room from the first game. However, going off script doesn't help you just to see a nostalgic location. Actually, it can reveal something even more sinister in the form of a child's skull on the shelf in the background. Yeah, in a series all about missing children, we get one of their skulls right behind us as we head up to be dismantled by the purple guy. I mean, I guess we're the dead child in this scenario, because we've already possessed the animatronic. So does that mean that it's our skull, and that's why we don't pay attention to it? Or is it because we were killed, so we know it would be there? Halfway through at number 5, Nicknames. The news clippings at the end of the FNAF games always focus on one article. The place getting shut down, the place reopening, the place burning down, and in the first two FNAF games the stories on the outside weren't actual articles, it was just some random text meant to fill up the space. It's commonly referred to as lorem ipsum, at least it was when I was in school. However, in FNAF 3 Scott decided to include some of the story of him creating the games for the fans with the more powerful glasses in the world. One article talks about how his last attempt at becoming a game designer was a toss-up between a remake of his first game, a sequel to another one of his games called Desolate Hope, and an entirely new game about animatronics and pizza. 
He went with the latter, obviously, and that was probably the best decision he ever made. However, later on, he also reveals that the iconic names of Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, and Foxy were just nicknames he had in development. He would call them that before actually coming up with their real names. However, after calling them that for so long, he grew attached to the names and ended up keeping them. Probably another good decision if I'm being honest. Can you imagine what it would be like if Bonnie was named, like, Albert or something? Actually, that would be scary. And then four paper plates. Let's take a break from FNAF 3. In FNAF 2, on one of the cams, you can see three paper plate crafts that resemble the three main animatronics. Sometimes, though, they can take on a mind of their own. At least the Bonnie one does. It can sometimes not appear on the camera view and then just later appear in your office. How did it get there? Who placed it there? Was it an animatronic? If it was, why didn't they attack us? Was it a phantom animatronic? Can they even do that? Is this plate animatronic possessed? Was a kid stuffed into the paper plate bag? Like, I know this is a horror game, but like, come on! Nobody else is working there at the time, and so how the hell did this thing move? Oh, and uh, also it could have happened in FNAF 3, too. It was a short one, but it was a break nonetheless. Getting close to the end in at number three, Family Portrait. Family is everything to a lot of people, and while Scott was stuck in a job he didn't prefer and kept failing at making it in the career he really wanted, I can't speak for him personally, but I'm sure his family was helping him get through it. His wife and kids I'm sure are one of, if not the reason he woke up in the morning, so in honor of them and to get some more assets for the game, he used their images wherever he could. Particularly in FNAF 4's hallway, all the pictures on the wall are Scott and his family, and in Ultimate Custom Night, the face of the one you should not have killed is a picture of his son with the contrast crank to the max. Family is so important and Scott both honored them and immortalized them in his games by incorporating their family pictures into them, which is so sweet and honestly touching. Something that you don't expect to get from a FNAF game. Man, if only he treated Matt Pat like that. And ultimately, at number two, Living Proof. Let's take another break from FNAF 3. Okay, that's enough. In FNAF 3's minigames, we see the story of how Springtrap came to be. We see Afton dismantle the animatronics and then unintentionally release the spirits of the dead children, who then come to spook him or get an apology. I don't know what the ghosts of five dead kids are gonna do aside from keep you in hell for all eternity until you escape by mind melding with VR video game testers. Anyway, as we see from the game, Afton gets scared by the spirits and then runs into his spring bodysuit to feel more powerful, probably hoping it would scare them because it was this character that killed them in the first place. However, thanks to the water dripping from the outside, coupled with Afton's haste, he ends up getting snapped by spring locks and collapses. I've seen many comments over the months we've been talking about FNAF where people say that this is where Afton died. This honestly has never sat well with me. I always believed he was alive in the suit and now I know why. In this scene, we never see him stop moving. Sure, he could have died and possessed Springtrap like some have suggested, but if that was the case, he would have stopped moving. He also wouldn't have eyes that are full of life like he does in the Springtrap suit since, as I said before, we can see his flesh inside and those eyes are clearly his. Afton doesn't die in this moment, hence why I don't consider Springtrap an animatronic, because Afton is still alive and consciously controlling him. Afton himself is living proof that Afton never dies. MatPat even said it himself in his theory on that game. He said, notice he never stops moving. That's because he isn't dead. He only dies in Pizzeria Simulator after being lured back by Henry and being set ablaze damning him to hell. Finally, in number one, Butterfingers. On the main stage in FNAF 1, we see three animatronics, Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica. When we leave the camera or it decides to cut out for a moment, we can see Bonnie leave and then Chica, and then Freddy doesn't leave until like no, night four or something, right? Well, as the animatronics leave the main stage, they drop their iconic item. Bonnie loses his guitar, Freddy loses his microphone, and Chica loses her cupcake. Why? Where did they go? Do they just leave them on the stage? Did it make it more intimidating? I need answers, Scott. <laughs> Senpai noticed me. Both Scott and that bad. In a tent, Freddy the Red Nose Jump Scare. In FNAF VR, it is actually possible to be jump scared by a random animatronic that you can't see coming while you're in the main room that you start in in the Pizza Party minigame. It appears to be a version of Freddy with glowing red bottom teeth and what look like nostrils to me, but most people are saying eyes. But like glowing in the Photoshop sense, like they only have their outline glowing instead of being bright white on the inside and then glowing outward. It's like when you add a glow to the outside of something. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, just trust me, I, I literally went to, to school for Photoshop. And I make most of the gaming thumbnails, recently I've been making like all of them, so yeah. 
I don't know what animatronic this is meant to be, but based on the teeth, it isn't Freddy because he has individual teeth. And it can't be Chica because the mouth shape isn't right, and the nostrils. It's not Bonnie or Foxy either. I really don't know who this could be, but now that I think about it, those are probably eyes. I just like the idea of big gaping nostrils. Just jump scaring you. And at 9 FNAF 3 Puppet. While we all know the puppet for being present in FNAF 2 and also appearing as hallucinations or a minigame character in FNAF 3, you can actually spawn him on the camera. While sometimes you can see the reflection of the puppet's legs in one of the cameras, you can also see what looks to be actual puppet parts in Cam 8 in FNAF 3. While sometimes in that same camera you can hallucinate the puppet, if you look just beside the camera 9's box, you can see something that looks to be a mask, with streaks coming out of the eyes and a mouth just below. This could be the puppet, or just a coincidence. Or maybe it's something else that nobody has really cared enough to look into. I think it's the puppet personally. Maybe not a working puppet, but a puppet figure nonetheless. And it ate chewing gum. Chewing gum recently became a big thing in the FNAF series, only to serve as justification as to the links between two characters. But either way, it's still canon that Michael Afton loves to chew gum. So much so that he actually writes about it in the survival logbook and says that he wants to knock the bad habit. Yeah, it was never demonstrated in the games, and was kind of dismissed in the survival logbook until the latest Fazbear Frights book was released, called Step Closer. That proved who the character of Michael Afton was meant to be, the big brother from FNAF 4, the one who was endearingly called Foxy Bro by MadPat and I'm sure others. This was the only reason that that detail was included, to link him to another character. It was never shown in game, not even indicated. During Immortal and the Restless, he would just sit there eating popcorn and he wouldn't have gum anywhere in sight. I mean, I'm sure this wasn't established yet and Scott didn't think of it, but come on! Imagine if this had been right in front of us the whole time. Ha, ah, that would have been so good. Scott, update sister location. <laughs> and seven realistic baby. Continuing on about the books and their connections to the games, Baby could very well be a realistic version of Henry's dead daughter Charlotte who goes on to possess the puppet, which would totally be weird because Baby was also possessed by Elizabeth Afton. In the final FNAF novel The Fourth Closet, which is the final novel, the rest are collections of short stories, it's revealed that the main character of Charlie is the last in a series of robots meant to recreate Henry's daughter who was killed at the age of three. This character is also revealed to be the baby animatronic that can switch between looking hyper-realistic like a normal human, to the normal circus baby we all know and love, with the use of small pins with balls on the ends. And what do we see the circus baby model in the FNAF games? Small pins with balls on the ends. This is something incredibly interesting and revolutionary to the story of the games, but not in like a lore-breaking kind of way, it just shows that baby could look like whoever she wanted to be, and perhaps that's why she led Ennard. But after she couldn't do it anymore because she lost the pins, she was kicked out. I don't know, it's just a theory. A circus baby theory. I blew out the mic. And at 6, Grandfather Clock. Every FNAF game until Sister Location, you needed to survive until 6am. Doing so would have you complete the night and move on to the next one. However, when you complete a night and make it to 6am, you get notified by a grandfather clock. Obviously, most of us were just so relieved to survive that we didn't pay attention to it, but looking back, why would an alarm at the end of our shift be a grandfather clock? It could be perhaps because everything is just a dream, or maybe we have a custom alarm tone on our phone. I know you can customize ringtones on phones, so so perhaps that's why? I mean, you could argue that these games take place before cell phones were common, especially smartphones, but FNAF 3 would for sure take place in an era where phones were common. And Fazbear Entertainment has always been established as a company with technology far beyond its time. So perhaps we can say the same thing for this whole universe. You know, the universe of FNAF has a whole bunch of high-tech tech earlier than it's supposed to. Halfway through at number 5, you won't get tired, will you? In Ultimate Custom Night, the 7th FNAF game, there are a whole bunch of voiced lines that play after you die, depending on the character that killed you. You can get a range from long-winded stories dedicated to Magpat, to lines basically damning you and criticizing you for killing a baker's dozen of kids, rightfully so, but for me, they're all brave. However, there is one line that would stick out to those who played FNAF World, at least through update 1.2 when Foxy Fighters got added, where Toy Chica said, you you won't get tired of my voice, will you? Well, it depends. If you keep talking like that, yes. If you take off your beak, also yes. Oh wait, I guess it doesn't really depend. In Ultimate Custom Night, if Toy Chica kills you, you can potentially hear her say, you won't get tired of dying, will you? Which is both a reference and serves as indication that we're trapped here and we'll keep dying over and over again. 
Fun. If Toy Chica is there, I don't know if it's hell or heaven. No, it's definitely hell. I'm not Eddie. Hey, mommy. And for a child. Ah, bachelor number one. The child eating, capturing, and torturing, killing machine that won the last round of the killing floor. However, for those of you who didn't already know, and I'm sure there's at least a couple of you, the body of Funtime Freddy does indeed contain a child. As evidenced by the wireframe blueprint where we literally see a child inside of his containment chamber. I don't know if that kid is dead or alive, but based on the lack of oxygen, I'm guessing he's dead because, you know, Lack of oxygen. But yeah, in case you didn't know, there is literally a dead kid inside of Funtime Freddy. Do with that what you will. And at three, it's me. Hey, look, I rhymed. There is one FNAF VR Easter egg that we haven't found yet, but there is also a FNAF VR Easter egg that very few have found. The one only a few have found is the It's Me Easter egg from the Curse of Dreadbear DLC, where if you manage to get three clown posters in the victory barn, and then hit them all with a dart, the barn flips into blacklight rave mode, and the banner switches from saying you win to It's Me, in reference to Golden Freddy. We don't know what this could mean. Hell, it could mean that we're still playing as Mike Lafton somehow. But it's also weird because currently Golden Freddy is down in hell with William, torturing him for eternity. So it's unclear as to why this is possible, but it happened nonetheless. At least if we can believe the few videos that are out there. You say Donko found it, but I've seen no video, okay? So, pics or it didn't happen. I need to go back live stream searching for this though. Like, I, I need to know if it's true. Based on my own experiences. You know, that's the only way we can really know, right? And ultimately, in a number two, Help Wanted. During an interview around a month or so ago, a representative from Steel Wool Studios said that there was a detail or easter egg in Help Wanted that hasn't been found. I literally mentioned it last number. With the experience the fans have to tearing these games to shreds, it's almost impressive that we don't know where this could possibly be. We've torn the game to bits, we've boundary broke and data mined, but we still missed it? The interview reads, quote, The FNAF fandom is keen at finding hidden secrets in every Five Nights at Freddy's game, but is there something in Help Wanted that the fans haven't found yet? Yes. Oh, did you expect me to say it? No dice. The same interview, the infamous box was mentioned yet again. Could the two be connected? And where could the secret be hiding? Perhaps in the DLC? Curse of Dreadbear was packed with all kinds of Easter eggs and secrets. Could it have been there? Perhaps in the hallway minigame? Or maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Let me know your theories down below, and let Matt Pat know about this, and if he doesn't know already. We all need to put our heads together for this. But like, with reasonable social distancing and wearing masks, obviously. Put our heads together six feet apart, or more. Finally, in number one, the rules. Thank you to Maggie Shannon on yesterday's community post for pointing this out to me as I was scrolling through the comments. The rules for safety in the Fazbear establishments are simple. They appear on posters in the first FNAF game and they read as follows. One, don't run. Two, don't yell. Three, don't scream. These seem pretty reasonable, right? Even if two and three are basically the same thing. But rule four is where it gets weird, so I'll save that for last. Five, stay close to mom. Six, don't touch Freddy. Seven, don't hit. Eight, leave before dark. I would just take it as leave before closing. Rule number four is honestly the weirdest thing and is honestly scary when you think about why they would need this rule. Rule number four is don't poop on the floor. I'm being totally honest, you can look at it in game. Management even thanks you at the end of the sign. The FNAF fandom page has better rules than this. Hell, even most subreddits have better rules than Freddy Fazbear's. And we were all wondering why Afton was killing kids. Because there literally has to be a rule about not taking a wicked growler on the floor. Because if I was to do that, I'd be violating at least three rules. Four, two, and three. I didn't want to have to put it out with my fingers, because I would have failed that massively. Four, two, and three. No, I can't do it. In a 10 from the fourth child. Okay, I've proposed the idea that perhaps William and his wife, or baby mama, but most likely for this scenario, wife, would have had four kids instead of the three that we see in game. This was actually mostly based off The Immortal and the Restless, the TV series from Sister Location, where a woman is telling a character most assumed was meant to represent William that he had a son that was clearly his, but he was denying it. And after looking at genetics and then trying to explain it to people in my life who didn't really understand, it just goes to show how likely the actual scenario is. If the babies came out blonde like Elizabeth, William might just have thought that they weren't his. So what if later William realized that the baby was his and wanted her back? 
or perhaps I'm wrong about the whole he denied it thing. And it was just a theory, uh, <laughs> until a comment from YouTube user Saber Sapphire on the Tiny Details Part 7 video from ages ago. I think we can all agree that Clara is an allegory for Mrs. Afton, and that William made Ballora as a way to cope with her loss. We can also agree that she's a mother figure to the mini Rinas, and that's what got us all thinking that she was meant to be the mother in the first place, aside from her song at least. Well, Saber pointed out that the number of mini Rinas that Ballora has is four. Ballora has four children, and if she is meant to represent the mother of the Afton kids, this detail could solidify this theory even more. And maybe, just maybe, that's where Vanessa came from. In at nine, false conviction. On an old timeline video, Shauna S commented, quote, quick little theory. You know how in the first game it says the killer was convicted for the murders? If that's the case, I think Henry was falsely convicted. But since they couldn't find the body, he got 25 to 30 years and got out of prison when Fast Bear Frights happened. It explains to me why he wasn't involved in the first few games. I will say I've heard a lot of different information concerning the missing children's incident, so my theory could be wrong, just wanted to put it out there. Honestly, uh, Henry being falsely imprisoned, or at least falsely accused, for the missing children's incident does explain a lot. Considering how there were no bodies though, there wouldn't be much forensic evidence. So the case would rely on circumstantial evidence to get a conviction. So the case could have dragged on for a while if it even went to trial. And if it was, it probably would have been going on until 1993 when the future Fazbear Frights location closed with William inside. 30 years is a lot of time for new evidence to come to light as well, and maybe Henry got out even earlier than that but didn't act until William was freed because he didn't really see a point. Well, the whole he was convicted thing could be explained away by Scott not thinking that there would be another game, let alone like nine others. Maybe he just wanted to have the story of the killer end as well. Yeah. Who knows? And it ate the bite of 87. The survival logbook makes yet another unscheduled appearance in my life, uh, but this time either solidifying or making the bite of 87 even more confusing. The bite of 87 being the mysterious incident where someone, presumably Jeremy from FNAF 2, gets his frontal lobe bitten off by an animatronic. We thought that we had the animatronic pinned as Mangle, but then Ultimate Custom Night comes along and proposed that maybe it was Toy Chica. Using the line, where's my beak, lodged in your forehead of course. I mean, what else could that freaking mean, right? However, I think the logbook can actually give us more of an answer as to who done did it. As if we could forget about the incident. That damn thing is ingrained in our brains so bad that we think the bite of 83 is the bite of 87, but it's not. Since, on page 87, we see a couple animatronic cage matches, with you determining the winner and then explaining why. On page 86, this is also the case, with both pages having debates between animatronics. However, Mangle is the only one that appears on page 87, and is clear set up to win being pitted against a balloon boy. Chica is also present within these kind of cage matches, but she's on page 86 against Freddy, which is a much more fair matchup, okay? Maybe, like, is this Scott correcting us from what we thought in Ultimate Custom Night? I don't know, maybe. Tell me what you think in the comments. And it's seven, Spring Traps Revenge. Yet another questionable business decision from Fazbear Entertainment. Spring Traps Revenge is a VR game that is the subject of the Fazbear Fright story in the Flesh from Bunny Call, the fifth book in the series. The story revolves around a game theorist, sorry, I mean a, a developer named Matt, who creates a spring trap AI using all of his anger from a divorce and multiple failed relationships. Hashtag relatable. However, the game is too difficult, so instead Matt reprograms the game to torture spring trap because he gets mad at the character he created. My question is though, why would they make a whole VR game around surviving spring trap when he was a real life serial killer? in their reality. I don't get it. Like, sure, in our world, we wouldn't care, because uh, he's not real, but it's not like Valve or Stress Level Zero is making a Ted Bundy or, like, John Wayne Gacy survival game, okay? Because that would be in poor taste and way too real for anyone related to the victims of those killers. So, why would Fazbear Entertainment willingly make a video game revolving around the killer that ruined their reputation in the first place, not to mention was their C-E-F-O. It seems like a horrible idea. Um, and it has greater implications for just how the series is in general. I, it's stupid. 
Why? <laughs> Who would buy that? Probably everyone. And it's six mediocre melodies. Okay, now this isn't entirely new news or news at all at this point, but we learned the origins of the mediocre melodies crew. All right, what seemed like random additions in FNAF 6 were actually set up three games earlier. FNAF 3's Night 4 Phone Calls has Phone Guy talking about multiple and simultaneous springlock failures occurring at a sister location. This isn't the place that we visit in that game, but rather just another Fazbear location, where he says that, quote, the company has deemed the suits temporarily unfit for employees, and that the classic suits are being retired to an appropriate location while being looked at by our technician. Until replacement arrives, you will be expected to wear the temporary costumes provided to you. Keep in mind, they were found on very short notice, so questions about appropriateness and relevance should be deflected. And while that could have been just some like crappy knockoff Frank Fazbear costumes from AliExpress or from like Spirit Halloween, the line of questions about relevance should be deflected seems to point that they aren't the normal Fazbear crew. And you know what? That would be the mediocre melodies. I mean, come on, his name is Ned Bear. Also, if you're enjoying this video, I want to see more FNAF because I, I know you all want to. You all love when we talk about FNAF and none of you think that we're doing it too much. Be sure you hit like and subscribe because come on, it's fun. You, I, I yell a lot. It's... It's my whole thing. Halfway through into number five, Matt Pat is canon, kinda. Thanks to the Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call, and more so, like I said, the story in the flesh, Matt Pat is basically canon in the FNAF universe. Like, sure, it's kinda nuts that, in essence, Scott wrote an an mpreg fanfic about Matt Pat, but the crazier thing is that it, it makes Matt Pat canon in, in FNAF, technically, since his name isn't Matthew Patrick, um, and he's working on a new FNAF game, not a new FNAF theory, but he, he he's basically Matt Pat's in universe standard, all right? Like, while game theory or Daco may not be canon, the essence of Matt Pat is canon, and he ended up getting killed by a plush trap baby that crawled his way out of his stomach. Uh, yeah, I haven't finished that story, and I don't think I ever will because I I was cringing so hard, but I don't understand how working on a video game turns into an animatronic crawling out of your stomach, killing you instantly, but hey, it's FNAF, and we've had people be possessed by video games, so who knows at this point, anything is fair game, and you know what, if Choo Choo Charles shows up, that's just par for the course. And this is also yet another instance of someone escaping from a game and entering the real world, and that's, I don't want to deal with that. And there's also the one instance of someone saying, it's just a theory, and then the book pointing out that they say it like their favorite YouTuber. So so yeah, uh, Map Hat and Game Theory are canon in the FNAF world. Or maybe Game Theory is like a true crime theory podcast where the host at the end says it's just a theory to avoid any legal issues. Also, fun fact, I didn't know what mpreg fanfic meant until I had to look it up for this video. My sister told me I was ashamed. In it for Cover Shadow. A while ago, I purchased the Freddy Files updated edition book, okay, in an effort to get more details and really find what things seem to be the most important about the series. It's an excellent place to find confirmed details, but one thing I noticed a while after getting the book was that there's a shadow on the front cover. If you look closely, or if you just actually can see what's going on, unlike me, you can actually make out the shape of a Freddy standing behind you, which I have to say is, is pretty damn terrifying, because this implies that basically anyone who learns about the Fazbear secrets because of this book, which is prevented like secret files on the cover, will get got by Freddy. Um, yeah, this makes me think that there is certainly something more to this company. Definitely something more shady that we weren't considering or aren't considering or that just hadn't been presented yet. But it's still, it, it, it could not, it might not be that deep, but let's be honest, it's Scott, it probably is. Uh, so yeah, this one cover shadow shows us that Fazbear Entertainment is ready to silence anyone who learns too much for any reason. Which is why I'm still alive. <laughs> Getting close to the end in number three, Crash to Desktop. Golden Freddy is the most mysterious animatronic of FNAF 1, okay? Being able to move through closed doors while staying limp with no endoskeleton and can even cause hallucinations like it's me and Eyeless Bonnie along with changing posters on the frickin' walls. I originally figured that they could do all this because of other emotions, uh, but why would they crash us to the desktop when they jump scare us. It's a weird moment, especially the first time, but it's certainly going to crash you whenever you get killed by this freaky fiend. So it definitely means something. But this does have bigger implications than we originally thought, since now the series is about video games interacting with the real world, apparently, and even FNAF World actually had those themes, setting up clock clues for the FNAF 3 good ending, but this is the first instance of FNAF interacting with kind of reality, and it's our reality, like not the in-game reality that we would assume. 
Maybe. Because you know what? This also happens with Nightmare in FNAF 4. So my thinking was, is this symbolic of death? And you know what? Since Golden Freddy is more than likely just a hallucination, uh, be sure you check out the video on that over there if you want more about it. Could this just be symbolic of like your brain or your heart giving out under an intense stress? I think so. That, that's it, yeah. But ultimately, and number two, hanging scientists. The sister location hanging scientists weren't there before they're revealed to us, because it's meant to show us that Ennard is able to kill and is willing to kill anyone to get his way. But that also means that there were other people working here while we were there during sister location. I don't know why there were, since it was literally filled with deadly animatronics and the only reason we were sent there was to put her back together like William had somehow asked us to do. But like, why were there other people there? Was the business still running? Is that what Sheikah's Party World was? Cause like, we know that they had been renting out animatronics, but why were there so many still there? Especially when they were only used for like a day. I mean, like we know why Baby wasn't rented out, but the others? I don't know, it's weird, but hey, I'm not here to judge how someone runs their business, but also that's exactly what I've been doing with every new FNAF list recently, okay? Just blasting William and Henry for their various OSHA and just human decency violations, so yeah. And finally, in at number one, Scrap Trap. What happened to Spring Trap between games to cause such discrepancies in his design? Sure, he was burnt in FNAF 3, but we then see him alive and well and then not damaged in Sister Location's Night 7 ending cutscene with burnt down Fazbear's Fright. So where did all this additional damage and warping and expanding come from? The head seems to be larger on Scrap Trap and so do his feet, so I genuinely don't know how this would make any sense, or at least I didn't. We know that they were the same person thanks to Ultimate Customized Voice Lines, but it, I was so confused as to what could have happened until it recently dawned on me. In my What If Golden Freddy Was a Hallucination video, like I've, I've already linked to it, I talked about how that would mean that FNAF 4 was a game made by Scott's in-universe version, since the nightmare aesthetic could be to avoid copyright issues. And considering how everyone who should have known about the scrap animatronics should have died at the end of Pizzeria Simulator, but then the scrap animatronics show up in other games like Ultimate Custom Night and even FNAF VR, in a sense, it makes me think that these characters are less than real, and that the discrepancies between Spring Trap to Scrap Trap to Burn Trap are, are just because Scrap Trap is a fake animatronic, or well, it's a redesign of Springtrap to avoid copyright when Scott was working on his in-universe games, or at least when Scott's in-universe counterpart was making the games. And his deal with Fazbear Entertainment caused the nightmares to be able to be present in Help Wanted, which wouldn't really make sense if they were real nightmares of a deathbed crying child. Plus, I think that we can all get nightmares from FNAF now. In at 10, the real protagonist. Orville the Elephant in Ultimate Custom Night is one of the animatronics that's pretty memeable. Like, not as memeable as some of his counterparts perhaps, but he does give us a lot of information if you are paying attention. Take this one line from Ultimate Custom Night for example. He tried to release you, he tried to release us, but I won't let that happen. I will keep you here, I will hold you here, no matter how many times they burn us. But like, wait, hold on a second. If this is really the voice of the one you should not have killed, whether you consider that Cassidy or Crying Child, then why would he say he tried to release you, he tried to release us? Henry was the one who tried to release William in FNAF 6. And if you want to assume that it's Cassidy, we know that the one Cassidy is referring to, since they said I won't let that happen, would have to be Henry, because he that's the one who released William. So, could it be that we've been playing as Henry this whole time with the exception of Sister Location and FNAF 4? I mean, like, we don't really release any souls in Sister Location, right? That would then mean that Henry was Mike Schmidt, and that the Mike who owned the logbook could be Henry, or I guess would be Henry, and then that we'd be reading it as Michael Afton? Man, that's a whole load of messed up. I don't want to deal with that. Speaking of messed up, only 19% of the people who watch these videos are actually subscribed, all right? You might not know that you're not subscribed. So do me a favor before we keep going, check the subscribe button, and if it's red, make it gray, all right? Gray is a much better color than red anyway, okay? Red is all anger. Make it gray, all right? You're welcome. And a nine intentional glitch. Glitch Trap is an odd character, an accidental addition to FNAF VR that somehow ends up interacting with the environment and altering aspects of the game. Why? I've always questioned why Glitch Trap is able to move around the curtain and even seemingly put us in a Freddy suit at the end of the game. Um, like, sure, he's, he's a he's a spirit, technically, I guess, maybe, actually, not even at this point, since we've 
learn things later on. But he's still game coat either way, right? And like he he would have to obey the laws of being game code. Like any being must obey the laws of the form they inhabit. How is he able to move things like the curtain? when I can't, all right? I'm also code in this game. I can't move the curtain. It's simple, all right? He wasn't an accident. If he was a glitch, if he was unintentional, then he, like, how would the ending even make sense? How would he put us in the Freddy suit, okay? We wouldn't crawl in there ourselves, right? We would just walk through the curtain and like nothing would happen because we wouldn't put ourselves in the suit. Like, come on, why was there another character there? No, did Glitch Trap replace them? I don't know. No, he. you know what? I do know. He didn't. He was He was meant to be there, okay? Since you can see this ending without collecting all 16 tapes, which would mean that Glitch Trap wasn't reassembled yet. There you go. Glitch Trap was an intentional feature in FNAF VR. In at 8, MatPat is canon. Kinda. Thanks to the Fazbear Frights book, Bunny Call, and more so the story of In the Flesh, MatPat is basically canon in the FNAF universe. Sure, it sounds kinda nuts that Scott wrote a mpreg fanfic about MatPat, but the crazier thing is that it makes MatPat canon in the FNAF world, in a way. Since his name isn't Matthew Patrick and he's working on a new FNAF game and not a new FNAF theory, but he's still MatPat's in-universe stand-in. While Daco or Markiplier may not be canon in the same way that MatPat is, it, it's still a thing. And you know what? MatPat ended up getting killed by a plush trap, actually a plush trap baby that crawled its way out of his stomach. I haven't finished the story, but uh, I had to I had to stop because I was cringing a lot, um, but I don't understand how he, he how he works on a video game and then it turns into him having an animatronic baby. I don't I don't get it. Okay, but hey, it's FNAF, and you know what? It's yet another instance of someone escaping from the game and entering the real world. However, this time it's it's. Springtrap, which is a version of William Afton, so yeah, joy, great. Plus, there's the whole other mention of like the Game Theory sign-off in another Fazbear Fright story, which makes Game Theory canon as well, so no matter what way you slice it, it's a thing. And it's seven explosive ending. William dies in The Man in Room 1280, all right, the third story from the fifth Fazbear Frights book. Quite extravagantly, from what we're told, he explodes into a pile of mush right before a pastor's eyes. So, how is that possible? How could could William just explode like that? It's not something that you really think about, but I, I have quite an explanation. William knew about possession and how it happened, alright? He knew about agony after his daughter got scooped and then his son got crunched. So, what if he tried to ensure his own survival by intentionally causing himself agony, injecting or installing some form of explosive inside of him that when triggered or when in the vicinity of a Fazbear warehouse or however he wants it to go off, would cause him to explode from the inside out, creating what is possibly one of the most agonizing ways to die even for the FNAF series. I mean like this guy was mental, even potentially injecting himself with remnant in an effort to stay alive. So for me, it isn't out of the question that William just kind of inserted an explosive inside of him just so he could uh, live on, in, in a sense, despite every bit of him being gone. <laughs> and it's six Arcade Conspiracy. The Arcade Conspiracy gets its name from one of the duffel bags that you can find in FNAF Security Breach, where we learn that something seems to be kind of off about this place. Yeah, I know, something's off about the Pizzaplex, how weird. Ah, quote from the Arcade Conspiracy, note, exit interview. They are working together, the arcades. They are hiding something, the glitches. Glitch them all at the same time. Then the princess will recognize me. She's testing me. I am not yet worthy. The others are protecting it. Let me stay. I'm so close. Just one more night, please. I can save the princess. Now, it's clear that this seems to be referring to the Princess Quest games. However, it, it also doesn't seem like we have to glitch the Princess Quest games in order to actually get that ending. We just have to beat them and find them in order from 1 to 3. And then, boom, we save Vanny. So, uh, what could this note really be referring to? Well, there are three arcade machines that seem to have mysterious glitches going on. The Balloon Boy World game that you can find in the theater in, like, Sun's little special hideout. Chica's Feeding Frenzy, which won't turn off even when unplugged, that you're supposed to be able to find in the bakery. And Monty's Golf A Arcade, that according to its duffel bag, shouldn't be in the mini golf area, but is. So, what's the deal here? Alright, what's going on with these games? We don't know because Chica's Bakery or Chica's Feeding Frenzy actually isn't implemented. We can't know 
<laughs> we literally can't play it. How about doing a number five, Dark Carnival? In the, I guess, uh, technically st still recently released FNAF spin-off game, Security Breach Fury's Rage, if you go by release order and not date at least, you fight as one of the four Security Breach animatronics against a slew of enemies. These enemies include the clown spring trap skin from FNAF AR's Dark Carnival event. And not only do we see the actual character, we see the carnival in the background when the character is introduced. Clown spring trap gets introduced in the second level to the game, and while scrolling through the street, whenever the background isn't blocked by buildings, Buildings or a fence or something. In the middle, you can actually see the top of a tent, which is no doubt meant to be the carnival. Like, I don't know, I don't know, okay? I don't know why there are so many clown spring traps there either, okay? I don't get it. Like, I don't, why are there at, why are they after us? I also don't know. And why we never see Magician Mangle or Ringmaster Foxy is another question, but it's still a nice little detail nonetheless, all right? I played through the game on the channel a while back, and I had a good time. I was finally able to wail on the animatronics that had caused me so much pain. So so, it was definitely a freeing experience. In it for coffee. In FNAF VR Help Wanted, you can see multiple animatronics. Obviously, that's kind of the main point of the game. However, the most interesting one, at least in my opinion, is the secret animatronic of Coffee, which isn't even an animatronic from the FNAF series. It's actually from another one of Scott's games, which failed, like every other game before FNAF, unfortunately. But hey, at least FNAF was successful. It's Coffee, and the game from which Coffee hails is called Desolate Hope. And in that game, Coffee is an autonomous service robot designed to tend to the needs of nearby humans. It's basically just a sentient coffee machine that actually makes coffee. Welcome to Yog Labs. Coffee can be seen in Five Nights 3 if you reload the level enough times and it will just be sitting on your desk, unable to be interacted with, and won't actually make you coffee, which sucks. Because when I'm freaking out, uh, cause you know a 60 year old dude trapped in an animatronic is coming after me, coffee would actually probably help, but I'll definitely also need it if I'm working from 12 to 6 a.m., right? Like, that's for damn sure. Imagine FNAF, but it's like real time and you had to do those six hours and you were only able to play it at midnight. Getting close to the end of number three, Hanging Scientists. The sister location Hanging Scientists weren't there before they were revealed to us. It's meant to show us that Ennard is able to and willing to kill anyone who gets in his way, but that also means that there were people working here while we were there during sister location, okay? I don't know why though, since it literally is filled with dead animatronics. And the only reason we were sent there was to put her back together, like William had somehow asked us to do. That's a whole other story. Like, why were the others there? Okay, the business wasn't running. The, the, like, is that what Chica's party world was? Like, were we renting out the animatronics? But like, if, if we were, why were there so many still in the building? Especially when they were only used for a day. I mean, like, we know that Baby wasn't rented out, and we know why, but like, the others? I don't know, it's just weird, but uh, hey, I'm not here to judge how someone runs their business. And ultimately, in at number two, Blood on the Cover. The security logbook is a real point of contention for the series. Whatever, okay, I'm not talking about what's inside the book content-wise, though. I'm talking about how there are literal pages covered or splattered with blood, and the restaurant just gave it to you as if nothing is wrong. What the hell happened to cause blood to get all over these pages? And then, thanks to like the finish on the book's cover, it's shiny, meaning that it's still wet which means that it's new, and I'm like, I'm prone to nosebleeds, all right? So like, I know that it's not a nosebleed. Y you don't lose that much blood, unless you're me, but that's that, that's a whole other story, okay? Why is the book covered in blood? <laughs> it's someone bled all over it, that's not even sanitary. Plus, you know, concerning, especially considering the reputation this place has. Someone explain it. And finally, in at number one, Scrap Trap. What the hell happened to Springtrap between these games to cause these warps, okay? Like, sure, he was burnt in FNAF 3, but we see him alive and not damaged in Sister Location's ending cutscene. So where did all this additional damage and warping come from, all right? The head is bigger, the feet are larger. I, I genuinely don't know how this is supposed to make sense. It this is something that I've been mad about for a while. Okay, I'm so confused as to what could have happened. I'm sure maybe there's extra damage coming from like wild animals maybe while well, he has to punch him out like some sort of God of War scene. It, I don't get it, okay? How did the suit head get bigger? It's not like he evolved. Nintendo Dark Carnival. 
And the recently released FNAF spin-off game, FNAF Security Breach Fury's Rage, which I just played on the channel, click up in the top right corner to check that out, you fight as one of the four Security Breach animatronics against a slew of enemies. These enemies include the Clown Springtrap skin from FNAF AR's Dark Carnival event. And not only do we see the character, we can actually see the carnival in the background when they get introduced. At least in the level they get introduced. Clown Springtrap gets introduced in the second level to the game, I believe. And while scrolling through the streets, whenever the background isn't blocked by buildings in the middle, you can see the top of a tent, no doubt meant to be the carnival. Why there are so many Clown Springtraps, I don't know. Why they're after us, I don't know. And why we never see Magician Mangle or Ringmaster Foxy is another mystery. But it's still a nice little detail nonetheless. In at 9, the house. The FNAF 4 house is one of the most iconic houses of all time. Okay, probably not true, but it's the most iconic house in FNAF at least. And we only get to see it in FNAF 4, at least that's what we thought, until the Curse of Dreadbear DLC for FNAF VR Help Wanted came out. In that DLC's main hub where we select the minigame we want to play, or in my case, have to play, we can see two hills in the distance. Whenever there isn't a giant Dreadbear looking over you, you can see a house on the hills. Very similar to how we see the house in FNAF 4 screens. Not only that, but if you turn the game to blacklight mode, press the button on the monitor and then turn around to look at the car behind you for 10 to 15 seconds, you can see Glitch Tramp dancing on the hill next to the house. Well, on the other hill. And since people were confused about who Glitch Tramp was, this is probably Scott's way of showing that the FNAF 4 house is his, and that Glitch Tramp is William Afton. But we all know that now 100% thanks to the man in room 1280 from the Fazbear Frights book in the flesh. And today, eyeless animatronics. FNAF 1 has the famous eyeless Bonnie screen that can appear during hallucinations or when you die. However, I know some of you may not be aware that FNAF 2 actually has a similar screen along with two others. Yes, FNAF 2 has three eyeless animatronic screens, all with a 1 in 1,000 chance of appearing. These being eyeless Toy Bonnie, eyeless Freddy, and eyeless Foxy. It's interesting how Bonnie is the only animatronic to have two eyeless versions, and Chica doesn't have one at all. I don't know how this applies to the lore, if at all, or if they're just hallucinations that Scott added to make us look for more mysteries within the hallowed halls of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, but it literally is, but it's the only animatronic that doesn't have an eyeless version. Like, it's Chica. That's kind of interesting. Maybe it's because she was the first and has seen everything. Haha, <laughs> so she has that eyes because she's seen everything. <laughs> and it's 7 Mask Switch. FNAF Sister Location is one of the more popular games in the series and has quite a lot going for it. Basically being a turning point in the series where the game started to revolve around the Afton family even more. However, at the top of the primary control panel through most of the game, you see what will become Ennard's mask. But every so often, for some reason, it changes to Lulbit's head. I don't know why, but it can. And then it will switch back at some point. That's it, really. Don't know why it changes, since it can do so before Ennard is even created, but it happens and it's kind of hidden if you don't look up there too often. So, there you go. And at six, Lulbit Butters. While the name of the number may entice anyone who is sad that the Brawler game was not called Furry's Rage, this is not about any interaction of with Lulbit to make butter. Rather, in fact, in FNAF VR, we can collect coins that we use to unlock various prizes at the prize counter. Upon collecting all of the coins, an exotic butters basket will appear on the counter. On the bottom of the basket lies a button for some unknown reason. When pressed, however, you can see Lulbit's screen appear on the monitor up and to the left of the prize counter. It's unknown why this happens, but it's still pretty cool and something not everyone will know about unless they've watched someone play through the whole game and collected everything or have done so themselves. But I guess most of you will have either watched or done it yourselves. And there is at least one person who has clicked off this video at this point because it wasn't about Lulbit's butter. Halfway through it at number 5, Secret Poster. This is so secret even I don't know what it looks like, and I can't find any answers or images on Google. The FNAF VR DLC has a barn as its victory screen whenever you complete a game. When you win, you're brought to this barn, basically. However, there are three posters that can be one of three things. And in the distance, there is a fourth secret poster that never changes. But you can't really get a good look at it without boundary breaking. And since I can't do that, I'm forced to remain trying to squint and see what it looks like. I think it has to be some version of Chica for sure. Yo, what is, what is that poster? Is that Chica or something? I think that's Chica. This has been bugging me for so long that I actually might have to get the mod so I can move around just so I can know. It's not lore solving and it's not really that important, but it's a hidden detail that is still hidden to me. It bothers me to my core. And it's for radioactive. 
No, I'm not singing Imagine Dragons. I'm talking about another FNAF AR animatronic. This time talking about Radioactive Foxy from the Wasteland event, I believe it's called. This skin for Foxy makes him glow bright green and gives him a second hook on his right hand. As if he had two heads because ra radiation mutates things. Get it? Well, the character also has a radioactive symbol on him, and I don't care how crazy this world is, there is no way an animatronic got that symbol put on them with radiation. It's an animatronic, not an organic being. So even the two hooks would be impossible naturally, meaning that this character was created to be radioactive, and that's probably the scariest thing of all. At least Fazbear Entertainment is doing something normal companies do, like dumping toxic waste into animatronics or something like that. This seems more normal than sending out versions of your killer to homes with families inside. With all they've done, it's nice to see them do some actual normal company things. Gotta love capitalism. That's just proper grammar. Get it? Because capital letters? No, just me? Okay. And a three, copy. In FNAF VR Help Wanted, you can see multiple animatronics. However, the most interesting one is probably the coolest hidden secret animatronic, and it's Coffee, which isn't even an animatronic from the FNAF series. It's actually from another one of Scott's games which failed, like every other game before FNAF unfortunately, at least until FNAF was successful then the other games did well also. The game from which Coffee hails is called Desolate Hope, and in that game Coffee is an autonomous service robot designed to tend to the needs of nearby humans. It basically is a sentient coffee machine that actually makes coffee. Welcome to Yogg Labs. Coffee can be seen in FNAF 3 if you reload the level enough times and he will be sitting on your desk, unable to be interacted with, and he won't actually make you coffee. Which sucks because, you know, when I'm freaking out when a 60 year old dude trapped in an animatronic is coming after me, coffee will really settle my nerves. But I'll definitely need it if I'm working from 12 to 6, that's for damn sure. Imagine FNAF, but like, real time. Dear God. And a 2 game link. This easter egg was pointed out by Matt Pat in one of his timeline videos for Ultimate Custom Night, where he started the video spending 10 minutes downloading a fresh copy of both FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night so that nothing had been unlocked yet. In FNAF World, you are able to dive deep into the game code and visit Old Man Consequences, who will say some things and then ultimately make you drown yourself before you can get out. This reveals a secret ending to the game and gives you a trophy for it. In Ultimate Custom Night, you are also able to visit Old Man Consequences, who tells you to leave the demon to his demons and rest your own soul. However, if you do this, you'll need to drown yourself again to leave the game. Doing this, while never even playing a second of FNAF World though, will unlock the Old Man Consequences trophy. Which is odd, but might be Scott's way of saying that the game is still canon. I mean, it did talk about sentient code, and that things in game can infect the real world, since you lay out the clues for FNAF 3, probably hinting at the fact that the game may be key in solving what the lore is going forward, since we're seeing the same sorts of things emerge. Sentient code, games affecting the outside world, and potentially working its way into ours. Finally, in a number one, it's me. There are only two people who have been able to get this easter egg to my knowledge, and it involves getting the Curse of Dreadbear DLC and completing a game to be taken to the Victory Barn. There you will find three posters reminiscent of the ones from the alleyway and pizzeria simulator. However, this is where the ability to unlock this easter egg is determined. You need to get three clown posters, which is incredibly rare, and I mean incredibly rare. Plus, you need to hit them all with darts, which you only get four of, and if you miss two of them, you're screwed. I've looked for this easter egg for hours on both my personal channel during live streams and on the live stream on this channel from before the previous lockdown since I want to find this myself and I want to so badly since if you manage to do this the barn changes to a seemingly black like version where the victory banner changes to read it's me and everything starts glowing because of the black light. YouTubers Johnny Blocks and apparently Daco are the only two to have gotten this easter egg from what I've seen and what have been told in the comments. Not even MatPat was able to get this and Eddie VR wasn't really trying. I may have to keep live streaming the game until I find it but it's going to take me a while I'm sure and emotional torment. But this series already does that. At 10, Ruin. We know that the main title of the DLC is going to be Ruin. Now, whether this will be referencing my opinion of the series or the actual state of the Pizzaplex is unknown, but based on the poster, it's possibly both, because the Pizzaplex looks absolutely destroyed. The Freddy statue from the lobby is in pieces, and there is plenty of rubble all over the ground, and you can see the walls next to the escalators are actually pretty banged up. It's not clear if this is exactly how the lobby will look, since this is just an illustration, not a screenshot from the 
the game, but it is still possible. They could design the damage around this poster, or they could have taken a screenshot and then had someone illustrate it instead, which is entirely possible. But given that this is going to be released in 2023, I doubt that they have stuff made properly for it. They may still be working out the storyline at this stage. In at 9 free. The name of the DLC may be Ruin, but I'm damn glad it won't ruin my wallet. Especially when the main game was oddly enough in ruins and still cost me $50. And this was before I started buying cheap frozen meals to feed myself, so I was pretty broke. But honestly, I'm pretty glad that this DLC is free, especially with the amount of mods that are probably going to come from it. And it's also probably an attempted apology from Steel Wool since, like I said, the original game was so busted and unfinished when it originally came out. Did you know that despite being incomplete, the original game uncompressed was 86 gigabytes? That's a bigger game size than Skyrim, for God's sakes. That's around the game size, or like a file size, or maybe even a little more than Grand Theft Auto 5. That's absolutely insane. And now it's around 62 uncompressed, which is nicer, and it's 41 compressed. But still, goddamn, that's a lot for not that big of a game when you really think about it. In at 8, 2023. Yes, as I said earlier, the DLC will not be releasing until 2023, which is unfortunate, but it could actually be a good thing. Firstly, it gives me at least another eight months of DLC themed content before it actually releases, if it is released in January and then the hype dies down for it. But it could also mean that the DLC will be even bigger and better than any previous one, like adding just a couple of more nightmare animatronics or a couple of more levels. However, this also raises the question of is this the case or are they just taking their sweet time because all of this is a free DLC? Like, can we really expect to play something huge for free? I doubt it. Like, the only reason it might be free though is because it's affiliated with Scott. But after Scott stepping down, I don't really know how Steel Wool would handle this kind of thing if they were doing it on their own, so I can't really say for sure. And it's 7 Vanny Cam. We can also see 6 monitors on the poster which have multiple images of security cameras and Gregory on them. Across the 6 monitors, there are 4 total images that appear with the bottom two being the odd ones out, and the four above that being two different images. One of Gregory looking surprised, and another of Vanny looking at the security camera that's glitching out. Very reminiscent of the iconic Bigfoot image that's very blurry, where he's walking like this. And I think that this is actually one of Scott's clever tricks. Like how he used the keypad in Sister Location to tell us that Crying Child and FNAF 4 take place in 1983, I think that Scott or Steel Wool is doing the same thing with this poster. By glitching Vanny out on screen, they're showing us that either A, Vanny was the entity that Gregory was talking to that was mentioned in the therapy tapes, or B, that Gregory having his vision glitch out when she is nearby is due to Gregory being a robot. It could be either, but it could also be both, considering how these are both next to pictures of Gregory looking surprised, and they're on both sides of the screen. Two pictures, two eyes. This is the real two-eye theory. And it's six, brightness. As always, the first thing you do when you see any FNAF promo art or any image that's related to FNAF at all, you go and brighten it to find more details or maybe even some secrets. And the first thing that I noticed is that there aren't any question marks on this poster. Thank God. But there's also quite a few things that got revealed to me. Firstly, at the top there are actually two windows on the poster instead of the one that just seems to show up in the original. These windows also look like they are angry eyes, which could indicate an overarching villain. There are also a very faint set of eyes in the top right corner as well, aside not including the ones on the left that are clearly visible, but the ones on the right could just be an anomaly since they are very faint. And I also see that the girl in the middle doesn't have any color on her aside from her shoes. More on that later. And the floor also cuts off at the bottom, but the rocks on top of them don't. Mostly because at this point the ground has pretty much faded into black, but the rocks would still kind of be visible. But but seriously, th this girl is in black and white. Halfway through in at number 5, Collapse. One of the big questions we, or at the very least I had after Security Breach was what part of the Pizzaplex collapsed after the cave-in during the true ending. And it was really up in the air whether it was the entire Pizzaplex or just Roxy's Raceway. I guess they kind of left it that way depending on what they wanted to do. But this poster and the title confirms that the Pizza the plex itself is in ruins. The whole place is a ruin. The giant Freddy statue from the lobby is destroyed and there's rubble everywhere. There are still some questions of course, like it is just an illustration after all. How's the rest of the pizza plex doing for instance? What happened to the other animatronics? What's the main goal of this DLC? But while the latter may have been answered thanks to another detail from the poster, I don't think we'll have any answers for a while. The DLC doesn't come out until next year, which is absolutely insane, but at least it's free. And it four eyes. And while Gregory's eyes may be robotic, there's another set that I would like to point out in this Security Breach Ruins poster. The red eyes in the top left corner
corner of the screen. Now, this is very clearly Vanny, but since I've seen a few people get confused by this, let me explain why. The eyes are red, which we only really see Vanny have, since Burn Trap's eyes glow purple and the animatronic eyes don't really glow. We also know that Vanny might have been able to survive the collapse due to her being controlled by Afton, but also because she was able to be on the roof before us when the fire starts in the rooftop ending. I mean, she gets pushed off the roof by Freddy, but we know that she was up there before us somehow, so I'm sure that she would have found a way around a collapse. Plus, if she's on the security cameras and the other showcased person is Gregory, who we know is alive, it just makes sense for Vanny to be alive. Plus again, red eyes. And they're in a similar position to where Vanny was placed in her first poster appearance as the shadow. You know, like the one where Freddy's rocking out and then there's like a bunny chick with a knife that we were like, who's that? Yeah, it's in roughly the same area. It's not in the same place exactly, but it's in the same vicinity. Getting close to the end of number three, Busted Chica. Now, when I make jokes about rearranging Chica's guts, this is not what I meant. Yes, that's right. My main girl Chica also makes an appearance on this poster as probably the most resilient animatronic in the group because she's still kicking despite being crushed by a trash compactor and then a building and still having most of her smoke and hot bod. Some of it was removed and cracked, but her face also has seemingly melted due to possibly the fire we were using to kill Burn Trap, or maybe just because a fire started in the kitchen when the building collapsed. She's also lost the lower half of her left arm, her left, not your left, remember that, don't make my mistake, and she's also lost her right leg warmer. The casing for her midriff and her right arm is gone, but other than that, she's fairly intact, at least compared to Monty. Also, interestingly enough, only Chica's white face melted, meaning that it looks like someone, uh, um, spilt frosting all over her face. I guess that takes the term busted to a whole new level. But ultimately, in at number two, help me. Very reminiscent of the Save Them minigame from the earlier FNAF games. I'm pretty sure it's FNAF 2. You can see Gregory's face on the bottom left monitor with the phrase help me underscore written in green lettering. This seems to me to indicate that we may have a potential plot idea brewing where we need to save Gregory and Freddy after the collapse of the pizza plex. But we know that Gregory and Freddy sit on the hill in the final shot alone the true ending, meaning that if we do end up having to save him, our player character will most likely die in the process. This also means that we will not be playing as Gregory, but more on that in a moment. The underscore here could also be another indication of Gregory being a robot, but it could also potentially just be a reference to a file within the main game or within the DLC that could contain some secret information. But I have no idea if that's true, that's just speculation for the time being. I'm gonna have to look in through the uh, actual security breach game files before the game comes out to see if there was an update that added one of those files. Since underscores are primarily used for putting spaces in file names without actually needing spaces. Or it just could be that we need help in this case. Finally, in at number one, Blondie. We do also see a new character on this poster, one we have never seen before. The little blonde girl holding the flashlight that is illuminating this entire scene. She's short, blonde, and wearing light up sketchers like the girl boss she is. But she is also presumably our player character given that she is front and center. Now as to whether we are looking for Gregory or if Gregory is looking for us is one thing, but I have a slightly wild idea that could help explain. The pigtails is very reminiscent of Baby, but this girl has blonde hair. And while we may not be able to see her face, I think that she may also have green eyes, because anyone with blonde hair makes me instantly think of Elizabeth Afton, who gets grabbed by Baby in 1983 and goes on to possess the animatronic. Now, given that we've made the comparisons of Gregory to Crying Child in the past, and the very familiar nature of this blonde girl, I think I have a reason why all these children have gone missing. Because they look like the original Afton children. Think about it. This girl looks a lot like the middle silhouette from the original Missing Children's article in the worst ending for Security Breach. And the rest of these children look similar to each other, at least using their silhouettes, because that's all we really have. Plus, Look at her light up sketchers, okay? Red and purple lights. I'm sorry, but when have we seen purple and it hasn't been an indication of Afton? Plus, the red is exactly like Vanny's eyes. This has to be one of the nine missing children, right? That got released thanks to the collapse of the Pizzaplex. Like, come on. That has to be it. Pretend of Scrap Trap. 
What the hell happened to Springtrap between games to cause such warps? Sure, he was burnt in FNAF 3, but we've seen him alive and well and not damaged in Sister Location's Night 7 ending cutscene, so where did all this additional damage and warping come from? The head becomes larger and so do the feet. I genuinely don't know how this would make sense. We know they're the same person thanks to Ultimate Custom Knight's voice lines, but I'm so confused as to what could have happened. I'm sure the extra damage comes from fending off wild animals, since you know he's a body that would attract scavengers, but how did the head of the suit get bigger? It's not like it evolved. My only guess is that William either broke into some Fazbear warehouse like the one he visits in the man in room 1280, or he made a new one to try to protect him better, since we see extensive damage and I don't really know how much time there is between Sister Location and Pizzeria Simulator, so like, he, he could have been out there for a while. In the 9th bite of 87. The Bite of 87 is one of the biggest contention points in the whole FNAF series. It makes some theories, breaks others, and has been debated since the very first game when we learned about this very mysterious incident. However, we've never really been able to determine who caused the bite. It's typically thought to be Jeremy who got bit, but who did the biting? Some think Mangle, others think Fredbear, and some think Toy Chica. And some think Chica thanks to Ultimate Custom Night, which honestly just outright tells us who caused the bite if you listen to Toy Chica's death lines. One of which being, where's my beak? Launched in your forehead, of course. Where's my beak? Launched in your forehead, of course. Which is where the frontal lobe is located, which is the part of the brain removed in the Bite of 87. This could also allude to Scott's clue on MatPat's FNAF livestream that said why would Toy Chica be missing her beak? And it would be because she caused the Bite of 87, and without the beak, she couldn't hurt anyone else. Like how I keep saying my pug can't really hurt anyone because he can't fit his flat mouth around you unless you willingly like give him a finger or something. I don't know why he scares people. And it ate Ballora. FNAF Ultimate Custom Night really has a lot of lore hints and clues for us, so it will be appearing a lot on this list and in other lists in the future, I'm sure. I'm just now starting to understand the importance of this game for all of FNAF lore. One of these clues, however, is one of Ballora's death lines from Ultimate Custom Night. After killing you, Ballora will on occasion say, These are strange circumstances that have brought us together. These are strange circumstances that have brought us together. And I'm sorry, but based on her other lines, I don't think she's just talking about how they're in hell or in purgatory. I think that this is about how they met. Well, how William and the woman that Ballora represents met. In a previous video, I theorized that maybe Vlad and Clara from Immortal and the Restless perhaps represent William and Henry's wife, a scandalous affair that drove him into killing Charlotte so that he could be with her, since she would have no ties to Henry anymore. But I wasn't sure of it. But honestly, those would be strange circumstances that could have brought them together. I mean, maybe he didn't kill Charlotte to be with her, but killing Charlotte drove her away from Henry into the arms of another man. Williams, perhaps. I mean, she asks, why do you hide inside your walls? Maybe she's talking to Henry and not William. And it's seven Stranger Danger. Ultimate Custom Night has some funny lines and moments. Comedy gold in the form of Mr. Hippo's death lines, or rather speeches about Lemonade, and Happy Frog and her ninja skills. However, one of the most iconic and funny lines has to come from Ned Bear. I don't know why these animatronics go so hard in this game, but whatever. Not only does he joke about being killed by obscure secondary characters, but he also just yells Stranger Danger. Stranger Danger! I think it's funny and a nice detail because, well, that's the one line that could have saved countless lives. But instead, the kids followed Golden Bonnie to the back room for more pizza, and instead of getting stuffed crust, they got stuffed into a suit. Literally, Stranger Danger would have saved their little lives, but they didn't listen to their parents. It's a shame, really, and it's kind of nuts of me to think that this is funny, but I mean, it is. Ned Bear is the only one thinking straight in this world, and I am here for it. I stan Ned Bear. Ned's Declassified Pizzeria Survival. Survival guide. Scott, get the rights and make it a thing. And at six, the one you should not have added. Scott has added a whole load of characters into the series, so much so that there are too many characters for my taste in Ultimate Custom Night. But some of the characters he's added are a little too familiar for him, and it could have lore implications that we don't know about yet. Firstly, Scott added himself into FNAF lore. Sure, it's not him, it's not Scott Cawthon, but he is the face of the indie game developer that made some games about the tragedies in the FNAF world. He used a picture of himself when he could have used anyone, hell, a stock photo, or even nobody. Then we have Cassidy, the one you should not have killed. This one is Scott's son, as confirmed by Scott himself in either a Reddit or Steam post, I don't quite remember which, meaning that Scott's son, in universe, is dead. Yikes. 
and he also added the rest of his family, just subtly, since all the FNAF 4 pictures of family or kids that are visible in the hallways are of his family, since you didn't have to pay for any stock images or anything, as confirmed by Scott in the same post I referred to earlier, addressing the one you should not have killed. The one you should not have added, since now they're technically dead. Get it now? Halfway through number 5, Final Moments. Something seems off to me about this game. Why would William be tortured in hell by a version of himself? That version of course being Scrap Trap. And I think it's an issue that multiple people have, and why the whole Mike Trap thing is so popular. Well, this is probably William's life just flashing before his eyes. Every animatronic in this game William has had something to do with. He was there in FNAF 6, he was Scrap Trap, he created the animatronics and the sister location animatronics, he caused the nightmare animatronics to be created in the mind of crying child. This is basically his whole life flashing before his eyes, but not in order, all at once. Torturing him for his misdeeds and the horrible things he's done. Maybe he regrets it and that's why he shows up as well. Or maybe he only regrets losing his children. Hence why all his version says is I always come back, since he hopes his children could do the same, or wishes they could. And at 4, wake up. Nightmare on or Nightmare on Net, whatever you want to call it, is one of the scariest animatronics there is. Added in the Halloween DLC for FNAF 4, Scott deemed him not canon, but he's still here in Ultimate Custom Night, saying I am the dark reflection of what you have created. I am the fearful reflection of what you have created. The puppet since William killed Charlotte, who ended up possessing it. But that's not the line I wanted to focus on, we knew that already. What I wanted to acknowledge was the line, This is a nightmare you won't wake from. This is a nightmare that you won't wake from. This is a subtle way of saying that someone woke up from the nightmare before. Like, someone may have woken up before, but this is a nightmare you won't wake from. Who would have woken up, you ask? Who else was the only other person to see the nightmare animatronics? Michael. Sorry, Crying Child. Oh wait, same thing. This line also helps prove my point. Crying Child somehow survived or was saved from death, like Nightmare also seems to hint towards, but we heard a flat line at the end of FNAF 4. That's because he was removed from the machine, not because he had died. I'm telling you, it's a thing. Getting close to the end in number 3, FNAF Multiverse. The FNAF multiverse is already a thing. The original novels are their own universe, despite sharing characters and plot points. The Fazbear Frights books are their own universe, even though they help answer other questions that we've had, like Scott said himself when he announced the original five. And the games are their own universe. But what if the games themselves are multiple universes. There are so many points that conflict with themselves when trying to establish a timeline. Map had decided to put emphasis on the events that were mentioned the later in the timeline, but what if they conflict because they're not the same Earth? I mean, we have the FNAF game multiverse thanks to the Fazbear Fanverse initiative Scott started, funding some installments in new fan games and helping them with marketing, retail, and merch. So why not have the games or the events of the games that don't help the timeline take place in another universe? I mean, it would screw up a load of stuff Stuff, but it could help explain a lot of stuff too. He didn't start a fanverse for no reason. There, it, there has to be some sort of tie-in. But ultimately, in number two, burning. Look, I'm all for setting the souls of the damned free of their chains and letting them move on. But we need to remember the souls that we're dealing with in this series. They're typically kids, right? But doesn't it feel weird knowing what happens when you think of it like that? Sure, we set the kids free in FNAF 3, but we know the Remnant can only be destroyed with fire, and since the kids are still here thanks to the Remnant, we have to burn Fazbear Frights down, causing the fire at the end of the game, but also causing the souls of the victims to be set free. We're burning the kids on the regular in this series, and in FNAF 6 we burn a load of them thanks to Molten Freddy who's entered, so he has multiple different souls. And the only one who wasn't a kid, William, managed to escape and got sent to the hospital where he would be taken into a Fazbear warehouse so he could possess a hard drive and come back to life again. It's nuts, man. I don't understand why so many kids have to suffer in this series. Scott must not be good with discipline. Or, or, he uses what happens in these games as discipline. Ha, <laughs> attaboy, Scott. Strike fear into their hearts. That's what my dad did. Finally, in a number one, the real protagonist. Orville the Elephant in Ultimate Custom Night is one of the animatronics that's really memeable. Not as memeable as his counterparts perhaps, but he does give us a lot of information if you're paying attention. Take this one line from Ultimate Custom Night for example. He tried to release you, he tried to release us, but I won't let that happen. I will keep you here, I will hold you here, no matter how many times they burn us. He tried to release you, he tried to release us, but I'm not gonna let that happen. I will hold you here. I will keep you here. 
no matter how many times they burn us. Hold on a second. If this is really the voice of Cassidy, Golden Freddy, speaking through the elephant, then why would they say he tried to release you? He tried to release us. Henry was the one who tried to release William in FNAF 6. We know this from his end speech. And we know that's the one that Cassidy is referring to since they said I won't let that happen. Which is why they're doing it at that exact moment. But we thought that Michael was the one who released the spirits of the kids in FNAF 3, which is where Golden Freddy has their happiest day. Could it be that we've been playing as Henry this whole time with the exception of Sister Location? I mean, we didn't release any souls in Sister Location. That would mean Henry is Mike Schmidt, and that the Mike who owned the logbook would be Henry, and that we'd be reading it as Michael Afton? This may deserve its own video. Holy crap, this could change everything. Intent Nightmare. One thing that was mentioned when we first saw it, but more so forgotten, is the complexity of the security logbook. It messed with everything we knew about the series, but then messed with everything we thought we knew about the logbook itself. One of the key things that sticks out to me is the fact that Mike drew Nightmare on page 41. Those were just an illusion, which we know thanks to the Ultimate Custom Knight's death voice lines from characters like Nightmare Freddy, who said this time there is more than an illusion to fear. And I am given flesh to be your tormentor. So, how could Mike know what Nightmare looks like? Crying Child was in a coma while he was seeing them, so he couldn't have described them, especially in that much detail. Where did he get it from? And at 9, FNAF World Hell. FNAF World is a game I'm sure we'd all like to forget. However, what I'm seeing again and again is the importance of this game from a lore standpoint, both from the Helpy Facts lists as well as this one. From the Helpy Facts list, Helpy looks very similar to the style of the characters from FNAF World, and I propose that he could be a crossover character, linking the two games together in an unexpected way as an example of how you can escape a game world. But now, I've seen that the characters of Tangle, White Rabbit, and Bounce Pot can all appear in Ultimate Custom Night, in motion using their battle animations. This not only links the game to the main FNAF canon, but also shows that William's idea of entering a video game and escaping from one came from FNAF World, a game that revolves around a game affecting the real world. And it ate blood on the cover. The security logbook is a real point of contention for the series. Whatever, I'm not talking about what's inside the book content-wise. I'm talking about how there are literal pages covered or splattered with blood, and the restaurant just gave it to you as if nothing was wrong. What the hell happened to cause blood to get all over this thing? And thanks to the finish on the blood on the cover, at least the hardcover version, it's shiny, meaning it must be new. And I'm prone to nosebleeds, but I know that that is not a nosebleed. You don't lose that much blood. Well, unless you're me, but that's because I have veins that poke out of my nose, okay? I had to get the cauterized in elementary school, which means I had to get like 20 small burns on my nose in each side, okay? It was a mess. But not even that would generate this much blood. So why is it covered in blood? We see coffee stains, that makes sense, but blood? And why are they only mentioning that someone else wrote in the book, not bled all over it. That's not sanitary. And it's seven payoff. There has been a lot of crap that goes down in these restaurants. Missing kids, murder, animatronics that they felt needed access to a crime database to scan everyone that comes into the restaurant that ended up failing. But even after all of this, no lawsuits or anything? We saw papers talking about the missing children's incident, but nothing about lawsuits. The company shut down to downsize, but we've seen no evidence of a lawsuit or arrests. Sure, they had an investigation, but not a good one when there was obvious dead body stench coming from the animatronics. I don't care how sweaty and gross these kids and this pizza is, nothing would make it smell that bad normally. This to me indicates some form of a payoff at the very least, like maybe William has the police in his pocket, or a deal with someone saying that if he finds the key to living forever, that he shares it and he gets away. There has to be something more here. If I was a parent, I wouldn't stop until my kid had found justice. Like, where did these 15 kids' parents go? And it's six performance. It has been stated before that the voice actor for William Afton, PJ Hayward, based his performance for the character off of Anthony Hopkins' version of Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, who if you didn't know is a cold-blooded cannibal serial killer in the movie. So bad that he's behind a full glass wall instead of bars, so he won't bite your face off. What if this is for more reasons than just being creepy? I mean, no body, no crime, right? If William was eating the kids his robots were trapping, it could cause them enough agony to create more remnant, and more remnant means 
more studying for the mad scientist, and one step closer to the answer to immortality. He didn't take killing kids off the table, something that most people in prison will even kill you for if that's why you're thrown into the slammer, so eating them isn't really too much of a stretch for this guy. Maybe it started off with him thinking that that's how he was going to get the answer. I mean, he originally stuffed them into the stomachs of the animatronics, right? Halfway through number 5, exotic butters. The security logbook is really appearing a lot in this video, and that's because in the hype for security breach, we've forgotten all about the f that is this book. Not only does Mike draw Nightmare in the book, a representation of Crying Child's death, he also draws things connecting him to other games, like exotic butters and baskets of money from Sister Location, or a gravestone seemingly similar to the ones from FNAF 6's gravestone ending, or the casual bongos from Sister Location, and a Freddy Fazbear logo with blood surrounding Freddy's mouth, like how Crying Child got chomped, or spooky animatronics and ghost sheets, which could be a reference to the missing children's incident from the first game, since FNAF VR Curse of Dreadbear DLC wasn't out yet. And this is ironically on the same page as the maze, like the corn maze from that game. And why is there a picture of mangled up Chica on the very last page of this book? So many damn questions that we just forgot about thanks to the new game. It's exactly what he wanted. And at 4, Nightmare Voice Line. In Ultimate Custom Night, you can fight off Nightmare, and his voice lines when he kills you can really prove what we've all been thinking. Well, most of us. Or some of us. I don't really know the ratio to Wilhelm versus Mikatori believers in the comments. Nightmare's voice lines include, You will not be spared. You will not be saved. Indicating that someone has been spared or saved before. But from what? Well, this next line tells us, I am your wickedness made of flesh. And who out of Mike and William is wicked? William, the killer of the series. His wickedness is killing, therefore Nightmare would be William's desire to kill, personified. He also says, the shadow fears me, and until this point I didn't know if he meant death or William himself. However, I think that this proves he means William, since the purple guy is the shadow of a man. William either fears his own desire to kill, or he fears the fact that it took his children from him, both Elizabeth and Crying Child. And to further prove this is William, Nightmare says, I am here to claim what is left of you, since he was burnt to a crisp in FNAF 6's fire. So there isn't really much left, just like how his wickedness came to claim Crying Child. And at 3, debunked. On April 1st of the year, or the year after it was released, Scott added Nightmare Freddy, Foxy, and Phone Guide to Ultimate Custom Night. Each of their mechanics was based on a debunked FNAF theory. Most interestingly, Nightmare Freddy's mechanics were based off of Dream Theory, proving that these games are actually happening and it's not a dream. Which makes everything more complicated because now, god, we have to figure this out properly. And you can't just go around saying it was all a dream. Anyway, the Dream Theory along with Foxy being helpful and the Phone Guy being Purple Guy were all confirmed 100% percent false at this point, resulting in a whole lot more issues for the series, because I can't just say that it was all a dream. Even if I wasn't doing it before, now I can't do it ever. Only FNAF 4 was a dream. It was like a coma dream. Great. And it's two hallucinations. Some believe that there are two spirits possessing the security logbook, and that one of them is Crying Child. But I believe that these altered texts aren't another spirit, since it wouldn't make much sense for the two spirits to communicate in different ways, one using faded text and the other one altering what was already in the book, which seems very difficult to me. I believe that these are hallucinations that we're seeing from Mike's perspective. He writes in the book in red ink, and that's established early on. But by the end of the book, Mike is incredibly tired and stressed, as indicated by the incident logs on page 108. Something happened at 8.11, but we don't know if it was AM or PM. Considering how we don't start our shifting game until late, we can assume AM. However, we wouldn't get to work at exactly 12. He'd be there beforehand. And if he was having to fight off animatronics all night, he would certainly be stressed. Stress and fatigue would certainly cause hallucinations, and even if we aren't seeing this from Mike's perspective, we would be seeing it from ours. Maybe this is where Michael got the idea to use the name Mike in the first game. Maybe by reading this, we are Michael Afton learning about who we are. This could be where we get the idea to go to sister location, or it could be just before our father contacts us to go do so. Finally, in a number one, death by Afton. So many people in the series die because of William Afton. Obviously, he's the killer, the catalyst, the one who started it all. However, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, at least when she's possessed a robot. Remember FNAF World's original ending, the introduction of Baby? Well, she ended up killing Henry, the man who's sitting at the desk. We know this is Henry because, well, he says he made Baby and can't deactivate her, but he ended up getting killed. William wasn't dead at this point, and Henry was the only other one who could have helped in the creation of Baby. He did so not knowing what William was planning, I'm sure, but then Baby kills him. Now, Circus Baby's Pizza World was shut down after one day because of what it did to Elizabeth, so this would most likely take place after that. 
meaning that Elizabeth was inside Baby when she killed Henry. Elizabeth Afton, the sweet little girl who got too close to Baby, took Henry's life. It's kind of poetic when you think about it. Henry's daughter was taken by William, and Henry was taken by William's daughter. In a 10's 1987 easter egg. At the end of every FNAF game, there is a bonus night. It gives you a bit more lore clues and more scares, and that's what we consider the sixth night. But then after beating it, you unlock a special seventh night where you can customize the level of the animatronics and give them specific difficulty ratings to see how you can actually handle those certain scenarios. However, if you were to do this with Five Nights one, you'd obviously be looking for more clues since we literally had nothing else and we were trying to figure out what would first be an incredible series of games. Uh, but if you tried to solve anything and you tried to be a little sneaky to figure out what that whole bite thing was about and you put the animatronic levels to be 1987 in that order, like 1, 9, 8, and 7, the year of the bite, you'd end up getting instantly jump scared by Golden Freddy. Which is funny, but it could have had deeper implications. If you look at it through the lens of every detail means something something, if you end up really thinking about it, and probably too much, you can end up seeing this as an implication that maybe Golden Freddy caused the bite of 87, and that Jeremy Fitzgerald, who we would play as in FNAF 2, who many assume to be the bite victim, could be the one possessing the animatronic. At least if we ignore that the whole missing children's incident thing takes place two years prior. But then again, that's just something else that we would have to ignore, so it still works. In a nice same path. Now, part of the strategy behind the FNAF games is that the animatronics will always follow the same route every time, or I guess, rather, they'll come towards you the same way every time. In FNAF 1 specifically, Bonnie always comes down the left hall, while Chica and Freddy always go down the right side. And the same remains true for the rest of the games, which technically, if you think about it, means that these characters are coded this way. If they were just free roaming, that would be one thing, but the fact that they come after you and do so the same way each time would suggest that this is actually intentional. I mean, yeah, sure, twice is a coincidence, but don't they say that three is a pattern? Well, it's the same thing here, okay? In multiple games, the animatronics come down the same path every time. FNAF 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 4, Ultimate Custom Night, and not even just that, but the fact that the animatronics do this multiple times within the same game. Hell, how many times does Bonnie come at you down the left hall in one night, let alone throughout the whole week that you play? So yeah, we would have to logically ignore this detail because it would muddy everything else up way too much. And we have been, actually. In a death coin. In Ultimate Custom Night, you are able to get an item called a death coin. This allows you to use it and eliminate any animatronic from the game. This works with most animatronics. It removes them from play, and then you won't have to deal with them for the rest of that playthrough, or I guess technically life. I'm not really sure how you... Uh, ultimate custom night defines things, but there is at least to my knowledge one animatronic that this coin does not work on That being Golden Freddy if you try it on Golden Freddy and you use the death coin on him You end up getting jump scared by the Fredbear plush who some believe is meant to be psychic friend Fredbear And while it would make sense that you can't remove Golden Freddy because seemingly they'd be the one controlling everything Or the animatronic that gives you the most grief depending on the situation you believe is taking place The fact that Fredbear is the one that uh, jump scares you the, the actual like plush has to kind of be taken with a grain of salt. Because honestly, it may not have that deep of an impact. And if it did, we have really no idea what the hell that would be. Especially when Ultimate Custom Night seemingly tried to wrap up the Afton family storyline. And it's Seven Joy of Creation. There are actually some references to some of the Fazbear fan vs. Initiative games in Security Breach. For example, the Joy of Creation Easter egg of Ignited Freddy and Ignited Bonnie, found on the House of Bear and House of Bear 2 arcade cabinets found around the Pizza Plex. This is something that I actually picked up on my first time through, so needless to say, it was pretty cool that I was right about that. I was like, hey, isn't that Ignited Freddy? And it was. And the House of Bear cabinet has like the Ignited Freddy shadow standing in the doorway, and then the House of Bear 2 machine features Ignited Bonnie's face, which could be considered Withered Bonnie, but given the context of the Ignited Freddy in the first one, I'm gonna have to say it's Ignited Bonnie. But, if you really wanna think about this, this could explain how like the Fazbear games fit into the timeline, since the fanverse could be the games that Scott's in Universe counterpart made, which which would explain why they would have their own FNAF 1 titled FNAF Plus, but honestly, we're 
probably meant to ignore this idea. Because let's be honest, if that was the FNAF 1 of this universe, the company wouldn't have arcade cabinets featuring the characters. So, this is probably just meant to be like a happy little reference for fans of that series and, and nothing more. Uh, plus, it's, it's Steel Wool who was doing that and not Scott. And at 6, crashing. Golden Freddy has some weird abilities, okay? Like, what's with the whole crashing us to the desktop thing? Every other animatronic sends us to the main menu, but Golden Freddy, for some reason, sends us to our desktop. It's a very odd detail that I don't think anyone was really questioning, but it certainly seems to indicate that there could be something special about the character. Well, I mean, something more. And I don't think that it's simply maybe they're just angrier than everyone else and something like that. It would have to be more symbolic, because the only character that, when killing us, crashes us to our desktop is Nightmare from FNAF 4. They're the only two animatronics to crash us to the desktop instead of to the main menu, and while with Golden Freddy it may not make much sense, with Nightmare having the same ability, it may set a baseline for what's really actually happening when this happens. Nightmare in FNAF 4 is representative of death. When Nightmare gets us, we crash to the desktop in that game and truly die, which would mean that the same would have to be true for Golden Freddy, right? But then, that would make a whole load of other things messy if you want to assume that Golden Freddy is a real animatronic and possessed by Cassidy, who also is possessing William. So, you would have to ignore that detail if you're going down that route. How are we doing at number 5, Ultimate Custom Night Roster? If you want to go down the path of Cassidy being the one you should not have killed, that's fine with me, as long as you don't use that path of thinking to insult anyone who thinks otherwise. Since, after all, nothing is truly proven with this series literally ever. But, if you do believe that, for some reason, Cassidy Cassidy is possessing William to keep him alive to continue suffering, you kind of have to ignore the animatronics present in Ultimate Custom Night. Because there is no possible way that Cassidy could know about the Nightmare animatronics. It just, it doesn't make sense if she did. Crying Child is the one who's seeing these nightmares in his coma while in the hospital in FNAF 4, as evidenced by the flatline that we hear at the end of the game. And since he dies before waking up, he wouldn't be able to share this information with anyone. You can say that he let Cassidy know about them while while they were sharing Golden Freddy or something, but that's you ignoring other details in the series. And if Cassidy wasn't Golden Freddy, how could she also be possessing William? You'd again be ignoring every other detail that we've learned about possession. And why are the animatronics calling the one you should not have killed him if it is Cassidy? Cassidy is a female in this universe, as evidenced by her counterpart in the novel trilogy and the only other human in the logbook. And if you want to say that they're saying him because of Golden Freddy, again, how could she be possessing both? And why would she make these animatronics that she is creating call her him. If she's mad about being killed, why would she be referring to herself by her animatronic? Okay, it doesn't make sense. Unless Cassidy is possessing William as the vengeful spirit, and the one you should not have killed is Crying Child, who Cassidy is using to torment William. But even still, for this to work, you'd have to ignore the nightmares being present in that game. And in four nightmares in VR. On that same line of thinking, how are the nightmare animatronics present in FNAF VR? If we are to assume that FNAF 4 is an actual canon plot point in the series, then these animatronics being present would be impossible. The only way that this could make sense would be if FNAF 4 specifically was one of the games that Scott's in-universe counterpart made. That's the only way that Fazbear Entertainment would know what these animatronics looked like. And it would explain why they would be present in the game that they're using to say like, yeah, this happened, but we're better now. Since they're trying to rebuild their reputation as we learn in this game. But, that also calls into question every other game that we've played. Because FNAF 1, 2, 3, parts of 4, and even sister location animatronics are in FNAF VR. Which would mean that if they remade FNAF 4, because it was an in-universe game, every other FNAF game before this, or even before FNAF 6, would be just that. A game. Getting close to the end in number three, Fire Dave. Found in one of the various Lord Duffel bags that we can stumble upon in Security Breach, it's a customer complaint titled Hi Dave, which upon inspection reads, quote, customer complaint, you should fire Dave, he sucks. And while it is short and sweet and to the point, it's also seemingly a reference to the FNAF novels, since if you're unaware, in the novels William Afton was introduced, but at first he was going by the alias of Dave Miller. And considering how this customer says that you should fire Dave, I think that's a pretty telling way to reference the book's most infamous employee. And it's also a reference to the fact that Afton is in the Pizza Plex right below our noses, or I guess technically our feet. Though we would have to ignore this detail because it's not really going to have much more of an impact than that, just being a reference. 
It's, it's just gonna be a guy named Dave, okay? No connection to anyone else. Especially since, again, this game was from Steel Wool and not just Scott Coppin, which is where most people tend to use the whole idea of, if Scott put it in the game, it has to mean something. But if you wanna, if you wanna say that, and you don't wanna listen to literally anything else I've said on this list, this was made by Steel Wool, so can't really use that here. But ultimately, in at number two, Jeremy. If you spend too much time looking into names, then you're really going to be in for a crapshoot when it comes to FNAF. Considering how Scott has used the first name Jeremy way too many times for a fan base as detail attentive as this one. Because the name Jeremy has been used for the first Night Guard from FNAF 2, the victim who possesses Bonnie, and the first Freddy Fazbear virtual experience game tester who ends up cutting his face off because Glitchtrap got to him. If you really want to think that Scott puts every single detail in this and like it's meant for those details to all mean something special, how do you explain this. Okay, most of the time people just write this off as a troll, which means that if this is a troll, other things could be trolls too, right? You can't just say that everything means something aside from the Jeremy thing. That just doesn't make any form of logical sense. And you know what? It doesn't even make a form of unlogical sense. Since if anything, the name being used three times would be more important than like passing comments made in one game, right? Exactly. But it doesn't mean anything, okay? Bonnie isn't getting resurrected multiple times. Jeremy isn't Satan or something like that. It's just a name. It's not that deep. Finally, in at number one, Immortal and the Restless. This detail is the reason I made this entire list. This is one comment that I've been seeing time and time again. The Immortal and the Restless was a show to show us that Afton didn't want his kid or kids, so this theory makes no sense. These details and all the others are put in there for a reason. But like, we just went over nine details that we have to ignore either in general for things to make sense or for your certain line of thinking to make sense. Or that we've just been ignoring the whole time, meaning that we can't take every single pixel of a scene into account when trying to find the big picture. The Immortal and the Restless has never popped up again after Sister Location. There has never been another instance of that show having any significance other than just being something we watched after work in that game. It didn't reveal the mother's name, it didn't reveal that Afton never wanted his son because if he never wanted crying child, why would he have sworn to put him back together? Or revealed to Michael that Elizabeth was possessed, or literally anything else that we've seen happen in this series. It just doesn't make sense. The Immortal and the Restless shows up less often than the name Jeremy. And honestly, it has just as little significance as the name. It was a soap opera, okay? What I watch on TV doesn't mirror my life or my family's situation, unless it's Dr. Phil, and why would it mean that William didn't want a crying child? Why couldn't it be that William thought his wife was having an affair? Maybe if this does have significance, it's meant to show that William snapped and killed his wife when crying child was born because he didn't think that it was his son. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for coming to my Fred talk. Schooled. And the 10 map had his cannon, kind of. Thanks to the Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call and more so the story in the flesh, MatPat is basically canon in the FNAF universe. Sure, it's kinda nuts that Scott wrote an mpreg fanfic about MatPat, but the crazier thing is that makes MatPat canon in the FNAF world. Technically, since the character's name isn't Matthew Patrick, and he's working on a new FNAF game and not a new FNAF theory, but he's MatPat's in-universe stand-in. While game theory or doco may not be canon, the essence of MatPat is. And he ended up getting killed by a flush trap baby that crawled its way out of his stomach. I haven't finished the story, mostly because I keep cringing so hard, but I don't understand how working on a video game turns into an animatronic crawling out of your stomach killing you instantly. But hey, it's FNAF, and this is yet another instance of someone escaping from a game and entering the real world. However, this time it's Springtrap, which is a version of William Afton, so joy. I guess he will be busting out of the game. And at 9, confirmation. The actual confirmed information we have about the FNAF series is limited. Basically, Scott has only said a few things are true and a few things are false. The rest of these theories about the timeline and the logbook are all based on other theories. Scott hasn't confirmed the name of Crying Child or the name of the Afton family mother. He hasn't even confirmed if William had a wife or if his kids are adopted. He hasn't confirmed if the logbook is possessed or if Michael is the brother. Those are still just theories, not fact. And people treating these theories as fact and hating on things that aren't exactly what Matt Pat has said is extremely misguided. 
Yeah, I think you know where I'm going with this. Scott has confirmed that Springtrap is William. He's confirmed that Dream Theory, Foxy being kind, and the Phone Guy being William Afton or Purple Guy aren't true in the April Fool's mechanics for Fred Bear, Foxy, and Phone Guy for Ultimate Custom Night. And he's confirmed that Sister Location takes place in 1983, but not who did the bite of 87. He's also confirmed that Glitch Trap is William Afton using the Easter egg from Curse of Dread Bear, where Glitch Trap dances next to the FNAF 4 house in the distance. An Easter egg I showed off in our recent FNAF VR live stream. So stop coming to the comments of my theories saying that Michael can't possibly be the crying child because he's Foxy Bro. I said he was both, not one or the other. It's incredibly disrespectful to the research and effort I put into that video. It's just as valid a theory as anything MatPat suggests. Okay, rant over. Thank you for coming to my friend talk. And it ain't Phone Guy Death. Phone Guy's death from the first FNAF game is ultra sus. Firstly, we hear banging on a closed door, something that only happens because of Foxy. But then we hear Freddy's theme, March of the Torador. Then some groaning that's only given off by Bonnie and Chica, and then Golden Freddy's jump scare. Why all of this attention? Only on night 5 does it get this intense for the player, and the phone guy only has 4 nights, so why did this character come to such a horrific end? And who actually did the killing? We know that the phone guy thought he'd get stuffed into a suit, hence why he asked us to check them, or maybe he was planning on hiding in a suit to try to survive, since the main theory in this game is that they put you in a suit because you look like a naked endoskeleton and that's against company policy, but why would Golden Freddy have been the one to kill him? The other animatronics have priority while killing, at least mechanics wise, so why on earth is that happening in that room? Like what's going on? I don't know. And it's Seven Smiling Purple Guy. The first time we see the purple guy was in FNAF 2, and in the Foxy Go 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 minigame we see him sitting in the corner smiling. This is the purple guy by the way, not some pink guy. Scott confirmed that in the minigame section of the Freddy Files book. But in that minigame we see the purple guy smiling while Foxy runs out to greet five dead kids. Why? This originally led us to believe that the phone guy was purple guy, since phone guy also says he loves Foxy and distrusts the puppet. But as I said earlier, this was confirmed not to be the case by Scott himself, so why is the purple guy smiling? Is it because William's favorite animatronic was Foxy as well? Or was it because he was happy about the killings or seeing Foxy's reaction to it? Which wouldn't really make sense because these are animatronics, right? Or at this point maybe they were already possessed. Which led to the child possessing Foxy to discover the five victims. And then maybe that gave William a sense of power or he liked his reaction. I don't know. And it's 6 FNAF Plus. The Fast Bear Fanverse Initiative is a program created by Scott Coffin that gives popular fan game creators the chance to have their games reach a wider audience and be backed by Scott Coffin himself, helping them with merch, distribution, and console ports in some cases. However, one of the games in this program is FNAF Plus, a reimagining slash fan remake of the first game, with new assets, new models, and coding. The trailers make it seem way more intense and scary than the original, and it has a lot of implications for this universe. First off, it's not the same Freddy's we know, but since games like Five Nights at Candy's have connections to the FNAF restaurant, they appear to need to have one to fill that story. So this is kind of pushing them away from the main FNAF canon. But it also has implications with one of the other games, Joy of Creation's Ignited Collection. Since in Joy of Creation you play as Scott Compton, or the creator of the FNAF series, who's on the run from the animatronics. Which makes me think that maybe this is the universe that Help Wanted was referring to when they said a rogue indie game dev created games to make fun of the situation. Maybe the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative games are those games, and this is the aftermath of the series ending? Halfway through in at number 5, Multiverse. This also basically canonically inserts a FNAF multiverse into the franchise, which was already the case thanks to the several book series, but also opens the door to various other timelines. Like what if what we've been seeing isn't one timeline, but multiple? And this means that technically, every single FNAF theory has been correct in one universe. In one universe, Phone Guy is Purple Guy. In another, Scott Coffin is the name of the indie game developer. In one universe, I am guaranteed to be right with my theories, but that also means that every single person, no matter how outlandish the theory is, will be right at some point in one of the FNAF universes. And that's pretty cool, but also freaky. What if it's revealed that from FNAF 2 to now, all the games took place in the fanverse, since Freddy from FNAF 2, not Toy Freddy, but like normal Freddy, I guess normal, and the FNAF plus Freddy look fairly similar. Uh oh, I can feel the hate comments coming. And four hanging scientists. 
The sister location hanging scientists weren't there before they were revealed to us. It's meant to show us that Ennard is able to and willing to kill anything getting in his way. But that means that there were other people working there while we were there during sister location. I don't know why though, since it was literally filled with deadly animatronics. And the only reason we were sent there was to put her back together like William had somehow asked us to do. But like, why were there others there? Was the business still running? Is that what Chica's party world was? We know they were renting out animatronics, but why were there so many remaining? I thought they had stopped, especially when they were only used for one day. Like, I mean, we know why Baby wasn't rented, but the others? I don't know. It's weird, but I guess I'm not here to judge how someone runs their business. Getting close to the end in a number 3, 8-bit canon. The 8-bit minigames are very confusing. Shout out to Tessa, one of our editors for this idea. She edits most of the FNAF videos and apparently they make her want to play the game, so all I have to say is good luck. But she mentioned how weird these minigames are, and up until this point I did really forget about that. Having to glitch through a wall in order to give the spirit of a kid cake so that you can ultimately release all their souls in the real world to get the good ending? Like, what? That that means that those 8-bit minigames have to be canon, but also real. Like, how do these games actually present themselves in real life? There's no way that we as Shadow Bonnie are just flying around breaking into pieces, or are they in their own universe and are able to cross over at will? And if we can do the same by playing these, does that mean we're dead as well? Oh wait, sorry that works too much with my Michael is both crying child and foxy bro theory, so, uh, so people are gonna get mad, I'll stop. <laughs> Hashtag not salty. Not salty at all. And ultimately in a number two, forgetting Baby. One of Baby's most famous lines is, I guess you forgot about me, which she says to William during Ultimate Custom Night. At least from my understanding it's a famous line, or an important one to say the least, since this implies a whole bunch of things right off the bat. Instantly we get confirmation that Elizabeth is William Afton's daughter, since she wouldn't be saying this to a complete stranger. I mean, I guess William also... I guess it was also confirmed that she was his daughter in Sister Location when Michael said I did it, I put her back together. But like, eh, more confirmation is always good. And as well, this proves that William just ditched his daughter. Sure, he didn't forget about her since he sent Michael to go and put her back together, but he also didn't go see her. He gets burnt in FNAF 6, but until that point he hadn't even been in the same room as his daughter. So she must be pretty pissed, hence why she's one of his enemies while in a coma. This could also mean that he regrets not being able to see her and that he actually does care about her, since these would all be manifestations of William's subconscious meaning that any theory about William hating his daughter because maybe she killed the mother during childbirth or something similar are confirmed wrong, since he clearly loved her and regrets what happened and how he couldn't see her. Finally, in a number one, Fazbear Frights Connection. The Fazbear Frights books have been the foundation for a load of FNAF theories as of late, mostly because we aren't getting to see any really new security breach trailers, probably up until the game actually drops at this point, but this ended up causing a lot of division in the community, since most people don't think the books have anything to do with the games especially in the case of the original novels. However, I'd like to direct your attention to a post made by Scott Cawthon announcing the Fazbear Frights books, where he said that the books will help solve mysteries or issues we've had in the series. So it's 100% allowed to create a theory for the story of the games based on evidence from a Fazbear Frights book. Not only that, but while the games may not be directly connected to the original novels, they are from the same brain as the games, therefore will share similarities. So it's really just ignorant to disregard those as well. I'm gonna get hate for this video anyways, so I might as well say it. Thank you for coming to my Fred Talk number two.